I invite you to please extend your warm welcome to Mr. Daniel Kish. Well, if I wasn't nervous before, how does one actually measure up to that? <laughs> so, in the year 2000, I was approached by Ripley's Believe It or Not, Believe It or Not, <laughs> to, uh, to film a segment with a couple of my high school students, uh, basically running around like hooligans. Uh, uh, riding bicycles uh, among trees, uh, and doing a variety of believe it or not things. And uh, the segment aired under the title Batman. <laughs> now, I wasn't sure how to react to that. I wasn't sure whether to be grateful or mortified <laughs> uh, or honored or indignant. Uh, because the bigger the legend, uh, the more one can fall short of the reality of that legend. And legends of that proportion have enemies. Who wants that? So, uh, fast forwarding 15 years later, and the two blind high schoolers are now chief instructors here at World Access for the Blind. They're traveling the world, crusading around teaching Batmanhood to others. <laughs> and uh, if you Google Daniel Kish, Batman, okay, I dare you, <laughs> Google Daniel Kish, Batman, the screen will fill with dozens of media pieces uh, full of more information about me than I myself know. <laughs> and I'd like to share uh, just one of those pieces with you. It's a piece entitled The Real Life Batman from the uh, Discovery Channel. He's blind, but that doesn't stop him from riding his bike. As you watch him, remember, he can't see a thing. I have been totally blind from the age of 13 months due to a retinal cancer. I have no visual memories. So Daniel taught himself how to see with his ears, bouncing sound off objects like cars, trees, and poles. We have something that isn't a tree, it's uh, something else. There are no branches on it. It's called flash sonar. You're using sound to see with instead of light. In the animal world, it's called echolocation, and it's used by dolphins, beluga whales, and bats. Bats, for example, can echolocate, and they tend to navigate in the dark. It works like this. The click bounces off an object. The time it takes for the echo to return tells Daniel distance and location. Tell me when you sense it's there. Yeah. Today, this real-life yeah. Batman travels the world teaching his technique to the visually impaired. Left. Right. Right again. That click brings information back to the user. You get location, you get dimension, the general form factor of the object, and you get what we call depth of structure, which involves the density of an object, how solid it is or how sparse it is. Flash sonar is something like carrying around a flashlight with you and shining that flashlight into the environment, except instead of light, you're using sound. Using sound to see is what student Lanny Thompson set out to do after his world was shattered. He was hit in the head with a beer bottle. It hit the left-hand side of my face, shattering my left eye, my orbital eye socket, and my cheekbone and jaw, leaving me with nothing but a titanium alloy head. Uh, my other eye actually happened due to the fact of the knock to the brain left a lesion that grew, severing my optic nerve. Lanny uses his flash sonar to detect the edges of objects. 
This is definitely a larger vehicle. I can find open spaces where the echo takes longer to come back to me. Another couple of open spaces. To demonstrate just how well flash sonar works, Daniel agreed to the ultimate demonstration of his abilities. The goal? Find a ball in the middle of an open field. For comparison's sake, we set out our blindfolded producer to see if she could locate the ball using, well, blind luck. Oh. Was I on the hill there? Am I hot? Daniel zeroes in on the ball in less than three minutes. After about 20 minutes... I'm not close, am I? Our frustrated producer... Uh. throws in the towel. I give up! Daniel has taught thousands of people to see with their ears. On the streets, at home. He proves that it is possible to illuminate with sound. Coming up, the Incredibots that swim underwater and fly in the sky. And they call him the Wooden Man because his fa <laughs> Sorry about that last part. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this finding the ball stunt. Um, that was the only time I've ever done it on the air like that because it is impossible really to calculate the luck index uh, in a task like that. So needless to say, the Batman moniker has stuck. There is no shaking it. So what does one do with it? Well, <laughs> one flies with it. Okay. <laughs> So how does this flash sonar work? You, too, can experience this. So if you all just close your eyes for a moment, everyone here, close your eyes. And I'm holding here uh, what someone tells me is a, is a hotel menu, which I finally found a use for. Uh, and I'm going to hold it in front of me, and I'm going to make a very simple sound, a shh. sound. And you'll note that that sound doesn't change, it stays the same. But listen to what happens to that consistent sound when I move this menu toward me and away from me. Can you all hear that? Well, let's find out. Keep your eyes closed. There will be a quiz. <laughs> Here is the quiz. It's a pop quiz. So keep your eyes closed and just call out now when you hear the panel start to move. The sound will stay the same. It will change only with the movement of the panel. OK. All right, open your eyes. You couldn't have waited any longer, could you? <laughs> but <laughs> that was actually quite good, considering the fact that how much training have you all had in echolocation? None, none at all, right? So it really wasn't that hard to do this simple task, OK? Back to Batman. So, I've warmed up to the title. <laughs> what choice do I have? Uh, because Batman, to me, isn't about swinging through the air with a cape as a superhero. And it's not even about clicking one's tongue to find one's way through the dark. The deeper, more personal, more palpable meaning behind Batman is one that we can all share. It has to do with tuning into and manifesting our own real-life Batman, which we all have. 
because there was nothing special about Batman. Batman was not superhuman. He did not come from another planet or another dimension. He didn't, his powers weren't bestowed upon him by radiation or an alien being or magic. He was human, is human. Okay? So, like the rest of us, nothing particularly special. So, in terms of understanding how to become Batman, we have to just look at the process that that particular character kind of shows us. He manifested his, his superhero status out of his own flesh and blood humanity, wrought of perseverance, of courage, of fortitude, which are qualities we either possess or can cultivate. I'd like to illustrate this process of a normal person, like you and me, learning to uncover his own personal real-life Batman. And this is um, about a boy named Alec who attended one of our workshops and it was covered by uh, NBC News. I am 47 years old. I lost my vision due to retinoblastoma. Basically, what we'll do is we will kind of learn uh, how the whole echo process works. Very good. Now tell me when it goes away. What Daniel is teaching us is basically is to click our tongue and just go like this, look around. He said to, to us this morning, it's like the only person just looking around. Yes. Yeah, good. Flash sonar is a term we've coined that has to do with a specific type of echolocation whereby a flash of sound, in our case a tongue click, actually irradiates or illuminates the environment with that flash of sound. It's definitely not unique to humans. Um, bats are well known for this. Uh, dolphins are well known for this and certain kinds of uh, toothed whales. But this side seems corrugated or ribbed in some way. I said ribbed, so these striations here give the click a pingy sound. The more you become attuned to your signal, the easier it is to extract an echo based on the attuned signal from the noise. It's a bit like uh, if you're uh, listening for a familiar voice in a crowd. Okay, so we're using our canes, we're listening for where everyone is, okay? That for me today was way different because we were all, I was independent. I was maybe, sometimes I was ahead of Daniel, sometimes I was behind him. Um, and it seemed like my mom wasn't really there when I, um, when, it, when we were just doing it. I mean, I knew she was there, but it just, it was cool. The big, big, huge mistake that is often made with blind kids is we assume that dependency, the fostering of dependency and the fostering of restriction will lead to independence and will lead to freedom. Dependency cannot lead to independence and restriction and limitation cannot lead to freedom. I said I love this workshop. I love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yesterday, someone told me, um, with regard to coming up here and, and giving my talk today, to break a leg. <laughs> and. I, I told them I had no intention of doing that. Uh, so, Alec, a pleasant enough young fellow, 
okay? Could be any of us. Could be someone you know. Got some young people in the crowd here, okay? Alec was 14 when this was shot, two years ago. Some of you know a 14-year-old. Some of you have kids who are 14. There's nothing special about Alec other than his pleasantness. Alec was adopted from Russia. There are probably no records of his past because little attention is given to blind orphans in Russia. Why, why should there be? Okay, so we probably have no idea where he really came from or what his background really was or is. Alec is blind. He happens to be blind. He also happens to be a, an otherwise very typical 14-year-old kid who couldn't leave his hotel room on his own, who did not travel anywhere or most places unescorted unless someone had previewed the area and planned out the routes and deemed it safe on his behalf. Okay, but you've seen him. He's a very normal kid. So, everyone close your eyes again, just for a moment. Humor me. <clears throat> Keep your eyes closed. Now, you could open your eyes, please don't. Okay, but you could at any point open your eyes. Alec could not. Okay but you see about as well as he did. Now, if you were unable to open your eyes, no matter how hard you tried, please don't try, but no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't open your eyes, you might be very uncertain about what to do and where to go and how to get there. But would you really want someone overlooking your every move. Would you really want someone to determine for you what you should or should not do, and where you should or should not go? What do you think? Yes, that would be wonderful, or no, that wouldn't be so great? Okay, that's the answer I wanted to hear, but you all knew that. Go ahead and open your eyes. <coughs> So why should it be any different for blind people, like Alec, like myself? In fact, it isn't, okay? Just because you're blind does not mean that you don't have the same appreciation of and value for the same freedoms and opportunities for life and livelihood that everyone else values and enjoys. So what do we do about Alec? Well, Alec decides one day to uncover his own real-life Batman. Okay? And how does this process work? He illustrates this for us. The first thing that needs to happen, at least in my own experience and my own observation, is the need to neutralize fear of the unknown. Sounds simple. Neutralize fear of the unknown, okay? Now, what better example of this than a blind person who cannot see, who wants to learn to get around anyway, to effectively learn to see anyway? Because fear of the dark is man's most primal fear, okay? And it's just a uh, representation of fear of the unknown, fear of the dark, fear of the unknown. It's really just the same thing. One is sort of concrete, the other is abstract. Alec does this. He lets go of the helping hand. He learns to step out into his own darkness without fear and appreciate that darkness and his ability to establish and govern his own relationship to it. 
Now, he cheated. He's blind. That makes it relatively easy. Okay? I'm also a cheater. I've, <laughs> I've been blind for most of my life. Okay? So it's easy for me. Blind people who have adapted to their blindness have a, an advantage in this particular regard. You learn to not really care so much about the dark. So darkness holds no sway over me, and the unknown uh, has me little concerned. Okay? But you can do this without having to cheat. You don't have to go blind, okay, and then you know, go through one of my own workshops or do whatever you have to do to learn to neutralize that fear. And Alec shows us how to go about doing that as well. The key to this is challenging everything you think you know. What has conditioned us? What has formed us? What has patterned us? What has programmed us? What <clears throat> is it that governs our thinking? So, when we challenge everything we think we know, <clears throat> we also must challenge what I call conventional wisdom. Because it is the purpose of conventional wisdom to maintain the status quo. That's what convention does. That's what conventional wisdom does. It maintains the status quo. It tells us what not to do. You cannot have convention and change at the very same time. Okay? So, my parents did this. They did not listen to what was conventional for blind people in those days. If I were following conventions around blindness, I would not be here today. And if I were here, I certainly wouldn't be talking about this today. How would I even get here today? Okay, if I were maintained to convention. In my day, ever so long ago, most blind kids were not mainstreamed. Most blind kids did not participate in regular community activities. Uh, they did not go to regular schools, etc., etc. They were not running around climbing trees or riding bicycles or playing cops and robbers with their friends, etc. Okay? I did all of those things because my parents valued my freedom as an individual. Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind, <clears throat> When they agreed to have the workshop, initially when they were approached, they said, they said, no, very nice people, but we already do some of this and we think we have this covered. Okay. Now, having this covered basically means uh, someone like Alex, or Alec, forgive me, um, that happened 90% of the time when I was working with him in the workshop, he never corrected me, by the way. It was, uh, it was the other boy there who corrected me every single time. <laughs> um, by, his, by, by convention, okay, he didn't get around by himself very much. When entering an unfamiliar area, he waited for others to explain or guide or determine safety measures, etc. Now, I went through Vermont, because I knew someone there. I did a presentation to the Vermont Association. At, at that point, they said, sure, that sounds interesting, let's do it. Okay. And it was at that point that they began to challenge what they thought they knew. And when Alec heard about the workshop, he and his parents ran with it. Okay, they ran with it. And Alec, his last words were, I love this workshop. I love it. What he loves is the release from a convention or a set of conventions 
that held him restricted and to some degree subservient. Okay, now, when we challenge everything we think we know, this leads to change. And when we will ourselves to change, we will our brain to change. So, in my case, I was conditioned by my parents to reach for more, okay, for better or worse. That's what I did. And in the process of so doing, I reached for vision. And the result, well, we'll have a look at the result. The result was a changing brain, according to brain scans done back in 2009. A number of research projects have shown that people who are blind um, are in some ways redeploying uh, the visual brain uh, in such a way that they are truly seeing and appreciating the world around them and that that visual brain does light up um, even though it's never received a visual input. So in many ways, uh, this fantastic additional computing power of the brain which is used for vision is being redeployed as a way of seeing the world um, in the mind's eye. What this tells us is a number of things. We can use uh, parts of the brain that are normally devoted to vision uh, to process auditory information uh, when visual information is removed. For me personally, this has been a really great experience because I've been working on the echolocation of bats uh, and we've only recently started working on echolocation with humans. Now having Daniel here around is like almost being able to talk to a bat. And Daniel is not only an exceptionally good at echolocation, he's also exceptionally good at verbalizing how he does it. See? <laughs> Can't get away from it. <laughs> in fact, in 2004, there was both a, uh, a major uh, television piece and a major um, printed piece that was published in Der Spiegel magazine, which is the biggest German-speaking magazine in Europe. It's really one of the biggest magazines in all of Europe. And it was entitled Der Fletermausmann. <laughs> so, here's the interesting thing about the brain. And, and this will tickle the fancy of you consciousness people out there. Okay. <laughs> what comes first, the brain or the will? Because we would say that if you will yourself to change, then your brain changes. It does. We know this. Lots of scientific evidence around this. Quite concrete stuff, okay? But you cannot do or think or feel anything without your brain knowing about it first. It is the center, and it is the genesis of how we act and how we respond. At least that's what I would propose. So I would submit to you that your brain already knows, already is beginning the process of change even before you become conscious of the will to do it. If that is true, then all we have to do is ride that wave. We ride the brain wave. The final element Oh, well, so the, the last thing I want to say about change uh, is a saying that I had to trace back to its roots. Who actually said this? You've heard, uh, if you do what you've always done, you get what you've always gotten. Does anyone hear who made that famous? Did anyone here know who made that famous? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people think so. It was actually Tony Robbins who made that famous, but he wasn't the first one to say it it, or to, to express a similar sentiment. The original sentiment is, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. 
Mark Twain. Okay, none other than. And that brings us to the next bit here, which is vision. So, we've shared the immortal words of Mark Twain. Now, in the immortal words of Helen Keller, the greatest tragedy in life is people who have sight but no vision. We know our sight acuity. I know my sight acuity. That's easy, okay? Totally blind for longer than I can remember. Uh, any Star Trek fans out here? Yep. All right. A few. <clears throat> Next generation? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Captain Picard, my hero. So, there was an episode called Timescape, in which Picard and Data come back to the Enterprise and they find the entire crew frozen. Okay? It's pretty eerie, because all these folks are just kind of frozen in time. And there are mannequins dressed like the crew, made up to look like the crew. And their eyes, anyone remember the eyes? Lifelike, aren't they? Weren't they? Stunning, stunningly vivid. They were created by the same artist who created mine. Okay? Beautiful, as I'm told they are, but not very functional. And yet, though we know our sight acuity easily enough, our vision acuity is harder to know. How can we know how well we can see, how well we can behold that which lies beyond sight, that which lies outside of sight? I cannot claim to have the definitive answer to that, but here's what I would propose. So for me, I ask myself these two questions on a regular basis. Number one. To what extent do my thoughts, feelings, and actions occur or result from conditions external to myself versus my own free will? In other words, to what extent have I been conditioned to think, feel, and act versus my choice? That's the first question. The second question may seem more subjective, but I'm going to say it anyway. And that is, to what extent are my thoughts, feelings, and actions in the best interest of, short and long term, in the best interest of myself, and in the best interest of others. What is sacrificed? What is preserved? And what is nourished? And to what end? To me, vision has a lot to do with that. Because the more we act in the best interest of ourselves and others, I would propose, the broader is, the broader must be, our scope of vision. Now, this brings us to the final video, which we affectionately call our whiz-bang video, that, that culminates what I hope I've been able to share today um, in terms of others besides Alec reaching for more, and discovering their own real-life Batman. Because when you can see beyond sight, and when you can neutralize fear, and we, when you can challenge everything we think we know, when you can ride the wave of change, then you, we, can navigate any kind of challenge
through any form of darkness. And that, to me, is what Batman is all about, and that is something that we can all share. Let's have a look. It's like if you guys can see with your eyes, and we um, can see with our ears. Is, is the limit, and I think that within the foreseeable future, we will be looking at the human perceptual system and blindness in particular very, very differently. We won't be asking the question, what can blind people not see? We will be asking the question, how much can blind people really see? My name is Hector Elias. I am 17 years old. I am losing my vision. I am expected to go blind. That they want to count you up. Here you go. You're it. And use right. your voice every single time you open up your mouth. Sing it for the boys. Sing it for the girls. This obstacle course here that I'm gonna do today is not just poles. Three, two, one, go. It is a goal. And the bigger the goal, the more obstacles you face. And on the other side of that goal is victory. Un Guinness World Record. Stop. Elora! a matter of enjoying it more or less, it's about enjoying it differently. You know, it's, it, it's enjoying it through, I, through different vision, through another lens. Those last two, the world record setter, which by the way has yet to be broken, and the very last gentleman there were the two high school students featured in Ripley's Believe It or Not 15 years ago. One of them now resides in Vienna and teaches all over Europe. He'll be traveling with me down to Mexico City to do a, a well, a version of the Ideas Festival down there. The other one just came back from Belize and will be going on to Croatia to provide training there. Thank you all very, very much. Standing ovation. <laughs> Great. Have a seat. All right. Thanks so much. Questions. Um, how long does it take you to train someone in echolocation to the point? I'm asking, you know, how long does it you take you or in terms of workshops to get them to a point where they're able to kind of go out on their own and you, you, practice? Right, right. Well, the functional ability develops quite rapidly. So our typical training period is uh, around three days, give or take. Uh, there's, there are big changes that happen um, just in that period. Alec received one day of training. He received two half days of training. And then he, he practiced diligently the other half of each day. Um, he did his homework. Okay, um, And then you have to commit to change. You have to commit to letting go of the arm. You have to commit to, to functioning outside of other people's supervision. And that's how the skill continues to develop and refine itself. For myself, I was 15 to 18 months old 
uh, by the time it became clear that, um, to my parents, that I was developing the skill. It's hard, I mean, how, and I know you're, a, you're also a, a psych, cognitive psychologist with a master's degree, so um, I think the, the, one of the things in getting to know you and getting to know your, your, uh, your story, one of the really interesting things I think was the whole brain, brain plasticity piece of what you talk about and, and what happened. Um, what other kinds of, I mean, since you've experienced it personally as a psychologist and as someone who has developed that skill, does, has that given you other, other insights about brain plasticity, just about um, your old insights about having that whole issue and the, you know, the ability of, of us all in, in many ways to do that? I think that, um, <clears throat> well, in the case of a blind person, I think that as you develop your perceptual, your perceptual awareness and your perceptual motor awareness, that cuts across pretty much all brain areas. So when we work with... Uh, uh, with individuals, uh, children in particular, and we're doing this perceptual development work, um, which revolves around touch and flash sonar, um, use of the cane, and we teach infants, by the way. I mean, I'll hand a nine-month-old a cane, and off we go, okay? Uh, and it's very successful. Um, and what we find is that a lot of other indices are impacted, executive functioning is impacted, the ability to, to actively make decisions and to organize uh, one's uh, affairs and one's environment and one's actions. Speech tends to take a jump. Language development, um, particularly expressive language, tends to take a jump. Uh, the way uh, kids physically carry themselves, okay? So for example, we had an autistic boy in Italy that Juan worked with, and um, he, he was doing cane training with the boy. The boy had never held a cane. He was eight years old. They just figured, you're autistic, you're never gonna learn. And he was up on his toes all the time, uh, walking. He was always on someone's arm, and he was uncommunicative. And in two hours of training, you know, his feet came down, he, he adopted a normal gait, uh, and he went outside, and his parents were with him, but he was on his own. He was no longer clinging to someone's arm. And six months later, when Juan returned to to uh, resume working with him, he was, uh, he was far more communicative. He had grown in his communication capacity in six months more than he had in eight years. So, so that perceptual processing, perception, is one of those things that cuts across all these brain areas. It is said that the visual system, which I would really call an imaging system, uh, occupies, uh, some would say, up to 40% of the brain. That's a huge chunk of brain, okay? Why not, why not teach it to see? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my name is Kelly Heaton. I'm a seeing person and a visual artist. Um, but most of what truly inspires me to create visual art comes from a form of vision that is what I would call non-consensual. Um, I do transcendental meditation and I practice shamanic journeying, um, both of which fill my mind with imagery and experiences. I use the term imagery because I map it to a visual or seeing metaphor, but really it's not that. And I wonder what kind of inner vision you have and how you may experience those and have you tried in any way to represent it? <clears throat> Helen Keller would like you. <laughs> I like her too. Yeah. Well, uh, that's a hard question to answer because it lies at the, at the basis, I think, of, of everything I do and everything, uh, every, everything I am. Uh, I mean, formulating this talk you know, was a highly kind of visual experience, if you will, a visceral experience. I see my talk laid out in front of me, okay? I mean, and, and just about any other talk that I do, um, when I'm working with a student, I kind of visualize where the student is, and I look, uh, I'm a developmental psychologist, so I, ha I seem to have a knack for looking five years ahead and 20 years ahead. So where will this student be in five years, given 
current developments? Where will the student be in 20 years given current developments? And I've been teaching long enough. I'm dating myself. Uh, I've been teaching long enough to know that, that I'm, I'm pretty close. So, so, so the imaging system is just that. It, it takes experiences, circumstances, whether they be sensory, whether they be ideational, and it represents them in the form of, of, of images to the conscious mind. It's, I, I think of it as a way for the brain to speak to the conscious mind. And, and, and that, in that sense, the imaging system is kind of a language processor, right? It takes all this data from experience, codes it, and then represents it in terms of images to, well, the unconscious or non-conscious as well as the conscious mind. And, and I think that's what we have there. If I could just extend my question a little bit or perhaps suggest something that would be fascinating to me um, as a sculptor and seeing you imaging sonically solid objects or objects at all, I would love to see uh, some of your sculpture. Well, um, if you, so, so there are a few videos online. You have to kind of fish for them. But there are a few images, uh, a few um, uh, videos online where myself and Brian um, view a scene using echolocation. We view a scene and then we sketch the scene um, onto paper. And then the, the camera does this clever little thing where it kind of superimposes the sketched scene on the real scene and everyone goes ooh ah. Over, uh, <laughs> over how well they, they fit. And one that's very easy to look at is another Discovery piece, Discovery Daily Planet. If you Google uh, Discovery Daily Planet, Brian Bushway, um, you'll, you, he does this, where he, they, they, they present him with an abstract um, sculpture that he's not touched, he has no idea what it is, and no one looking at it really knows what it is either. Uh, <laughs> and... He describes it verbally to a forensic artist who then sketches what he is describing taking shape in his own head. And the results are, are, uh, are, are mind-blowing even for me. And my mind isn't that easily blown. So uh, it's worth a look. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, uh, uh, I'm 10 years old, and I read your article in the National Geographic magazine, your Risk Takers article. Uh, I was, it was really interesting to see how you, uh, you talked about the way that you, that you have worked with so many kids my age and you've shown um, how essentially blindness is nearly solved in, a, in a, a way which is accessible to so many people. As you've said, uh, if a nine month old can learn, so many people can. And uh, I was just, going to ask, how do you teach kids my age, uh, like, like me, like a 10 year old, and uh, by the way, you, you said in your speech that you liked Star Trek, you know, you're not alone here. What's your name? Oh. <clears throat> What's your name? My name's Pavan. Uh, okay. Why isn't he up here speaking? I don't know, he should be, I don't know. <laughs> You may be contacted soon. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you by chance remember the title of that National Geographic article that you're referencing? That, it did, I'm pretty sure it was Batman. I'm yeah, not sure. it was, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, another one, yes. Uh, you know, I'd love to answer your question because it's a very, very astute question and a very thoughtful one and I teach several day workshops on that very topic. And I take kids just like you, uh, mostly blind, but occasionally not, and run them through this experience. Uh, basically, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a compressed experience of learning to see. Everyone had to learn to see, okay? You had to learn to see. Everyone here had to learn to see. You had to go through a process of learning to see. You just don't remember. And what you learned to do was to differentiate the stimuli around you. 
You learn to differentiate that stimuli, and then you learn to use that information to govern your movements through the environment and to establish your own relationship with that environment. So what, we've, what we're developing, it's, you know, it's a work in progress, but what we're developing is a process that kind of compresses um, that uh, learning to see process um, to teach people how to systematically differentiate uh, the stimuli in their environment and, and become able to govern their movements and establish their own relationship with their environment without the need for other people to do that, without the need for other people to govern their movements, without the need for other people to establish their, their, their relationship. And I'd love to have you in one of our workshops and then you'd have an answer to your question. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I'm Lenora Hoyt. I'm at university. I'm sorry, can you get a little closer, Mike? Oh, I'm, a... <laughs> I'm taller than he is. Yeah. I'm Lenore Hoyt. I'm at University of Louisville. And I think I caught um, the episode of, appropriately enough, Invisibilia that you were on. Um, and I, you mentioned then a couple things that really stuck with me that I'd thought about that talk a lot since then. Um, you talked about that a lot of blind children will develop their own cliques, and then everybody tells them to shut up, that's annoying. And <laughs> was, that, was that your yeah, the, the, uh, yeah. And also about yeah. that you actually sustained some fairly gruesome injuries in the process of this, but you just got to get up and keep on going. Would you be willing to talk about those things? Um, do, you, do you want me to talk about uh, people telling you to shut up or the gruesome injuries? <laughs> Oh, I'd like to hear both. about both, both since Bruce I'm in the injuries. same room with you for yeah. once. <laughs> right, right. Well, um, I was fortunate in that I, I had very few people telling me to, to shut up. Um, I, 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 I am the result of a confluence of very positive factors. They were not all positive. I mean, I, I come from a background of some domestic violence and yada, 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 so skeletons in my closet like everyone. But I didn't really have people try to shut me down as a blind person, or dumb me down, or restrict me, or anything like that. So I was pretty much shoved out into the world and told to get to it, and um, if you learn to do it now, you'll be good at it later, okay? So, however, I do remember a boy in Scotland, a uh, teenager, about Alex's age, and um, uh, I asked him, uh, as he came into one of my workshops, if he ever used sonar, and he says in a Scottish accent that I won't even try to emulate here, uh, that sometimes he thinks he can hear walls, but his mum says that's stupid. Well, I mean, <laughs> if, if you come to your mum and you tell her that I can hear walls, how is mum supposed to react to that? Okay, so... Uh, part of our approach is to, is, is to provide awareness to what this process really is, how it works, why it works, and, and what the results are, so that people will, in, instead of trying to shut it down, uh, will instead really support it into a, a, a tasteful and effective system of, of seeing when you're blind. And as for the gruesome injuries, um, I don't honestly know that, that I had a, a lot more gruesome injuries than children uh, of that generation did. Children of this generation don't, okay? But children of that generation, I mean, I, I came to school and there were kids on crutches and there were kids with broken arms and there were, there were kids who had injuries because they did something and they were outside doing something or whatever. So yes, I had injuries. But I don't know that, that I had more injuries than, than other kids. Yes, sir. Um, so at the beginning of the speech, you said that you could see at a young age, but you didn't have any memory of it. And I was just wondering, does that follow into dreaming, as in, have you ever dreamt uh, recently and you were able to see in your dream? And if so, what is that experience like? The simple answer to that is no. Um, the vision I had as an infant was um, 
was uh, highly reduced and distorted because the eyes were already quite damaged by, by cancer. And I was 13 months old when my second eye was removed anyway. So I have never had a visual dream. Uh, my dreams take the form of realistic experiences. So dreams are nothing more than the representation of what we experience. What I experience is non-visual, therefore my dreams are non-visual. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to add one thing to the last question, and that is uh, something that I was heard to say and has also followed me through the press, is uh, running into a pole is a drag. But never being allowed to run into a pole is a disaster. That pain is part of the price of freedom. And I believe that stands true for everyone. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I have some. I have a few, sh well, two short questions. Your name, please. Sorry, Ann. Zachary Hoover, Murray State University. I have two short questions regarding pretty much the uh, process of your echolocation, then a longer one that is uh, pretty much on the advancement of technologies to aid the um, visually impaired. Uh, the first two are just, um, first off, I noticed that with the exception of the bike riding scene or video, you weren't using any artificial clickers. Is there a reason for that? What, what kind of clicker? That you weren't uh, using artificial clickers. Right, okay. Um, what need have I for an artificial clicker? <laughs> uh, additionally, um, are you able to tell the different materials which you are um, bouncing your sound off of? Uh, yes and no. It's not so much materials differences, it's more textural and density differences. So, yeah, I mean, you get a sense of maybe metal versus uh, uh, concrete or wood, but, but more it's a sense of, of what are the surface characteristics, how solid, how dense, how absorbent, how highly reflective, and also uh, the texture. So is it very, very smooth? Does it have a coarse texture? Does it have a jumbled surface? Those are the, those are the main features that jump out to, to, uh, to someone using flash sonar. And finally, in regards to the technological advancements, uh, recently there have been advancements where uh, they have been able to uh, use devices to directly input signals into the uh, visual uh, part of the brain in order for people to be able to actually, uh, people who are blind to be able to receive visual stimulation at a distance. That's very, very much a work in progress, like, like many, many medical advancements, and it's going to have highly variable results ranging across populations. Um, we're not sure how such a device will affect someone who's congenitally or nearly congenitally blind, whose visual cortex has been uh, deployed uh, to, well, has it been repurposed? Has it been deployed to uh, accomplish a different purpose? We just don't know. There's, there's so much about that we don't know yet. Um, and we also don't know uh, how people re will respond cognitively or psychologically to, uh, to these kinds of interventions. So yes, bring it on, but let's study them uh, with circumspection and let's not get too hyped about it because, I mean, even now, the kind of vision that is receivable through these kinds of implants uh, isn't, well, I mean, there's cer certain things you can do, but in terms of navigation, it isn't any better than, than we can do with flash sonar, okay? And it's going to be a while before it is. Daniel, thank you very much.